Good afternoon and welcome to the Federal Railroad Administration's Fiscal Year 2020 Federal State Partnership for State of Good Repair Grant Program webinar. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to go over the webinar format. We will start off with a brief introduction, ask a couple poll questions, and then launch into the presentation. We will ask additional poll questions in the middle and toward the end of the webinar. Following the presentation portion of the webinar, we'll have a question and answer session where FRA will address your questions posted in the Q&A sessions questions pod. Today's speakers are Brian Rada, who is the lead community planner for FRA's Office of Railroad Policy and Development, and Ruthie Americas, who is the community planner for FRA's Office of Railroad Policy and Development. I will now turn the, today's presentation over to Brian. Thank you, Mary, and I want to welcome everyone for joining us for today's webinar. Here's the agenda overview that we'll go through today. Um, I'm going to begin the webinar with an overview of the Fed State Partnership for, St for State of Good Repair Program, which I also will probably refer to as the Fed State Partnership or Partnership Program for short. That first section will cover program requirements such as eligibility and various key definitions to keep in mind. Then my colleague Ruthie will give information on the application process. And I'll return to provide advice on best practices um, that you all can follow as you prepare Fed State applications. We should have plenty of time for questions at the end. And as Mary noted, you can type a question in the Q&A pod at any point during the webinar, and we'll add it to the list of questions we'll respond to at the end. Now, I'll briefly hand it back to Mary for our first polls. Thank you, Brian. So our first poll question is, what type of organization do you represent? A, state government, B, federal government, C, public agency or pol publicly chartered authority, D, local government, E, Amtrak, F, industry or consultant, G, other. And we'll just give that a few seconds more. Thank you all so much. So it looks like about 32% are state governments and 23 are industry or consultant. And 26 are public public agency or publicly chartered authority. Right. Our next poll question is, have you participated in any previous FRA Federal State Partnership Program webinars? A, yes, I've participated in a live webinar. B, yes, I've watched a recorded webinar online. C, no, I have not previously attended or watched any webinars. All right, thank you all so much for answering. And it looks like we've got 54% uh, have uh, participated in a live webinar and 43% have not previously attended or watched. All right, Brian, back to you. Okay, thank you, Mary. Um, yeah, encouraging to see the, the splits um, in attendees from a range of our potential applicants. Um, that's always good. Nice diverse array there, and then also um, good to see about half for about half of you. This may serve as uh, a refresher course, and for half of you, this should be a fair bit of new information, which is excellent. And for those of you who uh, who it is a refresher, I hope we are able to intersperse a few new elements or, or reminders throughout that will help you out. Okay, so I'll launch into the first section: an overview of the program and its basic requirements. So as you see here, the purpose of the Federal State Partnership Program is to fund capital projects to repair, replace, or rehabilitate certain qualified railroad assets. And our key desired outcome for the Partnership Program is to fund capital projects that reduce the state of good repair backlog for rail assets um, and or improve intercity passenger rail performance. Now in the following slides, I'm going to expand on this statement 
to further define the terms like capital project and qualified railroad assets that are important for project eligibility and also serve to differentiate the goals of the partnership program from other USDOT or FRA programs. You may be familiar with the Consolidated Railroad Infrastructure and Safety Improvements or CRISI program that FRA also um, uh, funds. And in general, these various additional requirements of the partnership program um, are somewhat more stringent and the universe of potential projects here is somewhat more limited than many of the other US DOT and FRA programs. Now the current funding opportunity, uh, which is published in the Federal Register on June 10th, makes available $291.4 million um, for awards. And as you can see, that's made up mostly of fiscal year 2020 appropriations from Congress, but we also have some remaining funds from last year's appropriations uh, that we've carried into this funding pool. There's no difference uh, between those funds. We are combining the 19 and 20 funds into a single pool of selections. So there's no need for you to consider applying for a particular year funding or anything like that. Um, there'll be no difference in the application requirements or evaluation selection criteria uh, among those funding years. As I said, I'm going to expand on a couple key definitions for the program. So the first is what we mean by capital project. So to be an eligible project, you'll need to have a capital project. And as you can see from the definition, a fundamental element is that the partnership program projects must ben benefit intercity passenger rail transportation. Generally speaking, intercity passenger rail transportation means the passenger rail services between metro areas and between states that are provided by Amtrak. Should include Amtrak's Northeast Corridor services, their state supported services, um, and, and long distance services. Local transit projects such as subway or light rail projects are not eligible under this program. The next definition I'll talk about is state of good repair, which has a specific statutory definition in this particular program, and that's provided here. And, and the definition here is providing you what it means when we would see assets that are in a state of good repair. Um, and you can see the, the definition elements include performance consistent with the design specification of the assets and sufficient ongoing maintenance and replacement programs to keep those assets in those conditions. They're in good condition. Now, proposed projects to this program should not be in a state of good repair. So when you look at this definition, you'd want to demonstrate later on that your assets are falling short of the definition. They might be short and deficient on any of these criteria. The third definition is what the Northeast Corridor is defined as in this uh, program. Because it does have a specific geographic definition. And it's defined as the main rail line between Boston, Massachusetts, and the District of Columbia. And then branch lines connecting to it that run from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to Philadelphia, Springfield, Massachusetts to New Haven, Connecticut, and Spite and Bible, New York to New York Penn Station. Um, and the reason that I bring up the Northeast Corridor definition is because there's actually differences in the project eligibility requirements, depending on whether you have a Northeast Corridor project or a non-Northeast Corridor project. And I'll discuss that more in later slides. Next thing I'm going to discuss is eligibility for the Fed State Partnership Program. And we'll start with discussing eligible applicants. Um, the other parts of eligibility are non-federal match requirements and project eligibility. And you do need your application to uh, demonstrate that you satisfy all the eligibility criteria. So here's the list of the eligible applicants. Uh, I think it's a fairly straightforward list, but I will note that the public agencies or publicly chartered authorities established by one or more states generally would include a number of transit agencies or commuter rail providers or other special purpose transportation agencies um, such as inner city passenger rail agencies that are, that are established by a state to provide service in their state. And then political subdivisions of states is just a fancy way, a blanket term for saying various local governmental entities such as county municipal governments. There is a selection preference for joint applications, um, and applications may be jointly submitted by any combination and number of the eligible applicants that you see above. Um, and I'll discuss that a little bit more in the next slide. And entities that aren't eligible themselves, uh, examples could be private companies, nonprofit organizations, a freight railroad, uh, they may be included and identified in your application as a project partner. 
Uh, these entities may also provide non-federal match funding, a letter of support to the project, or serve in some other role with the project. Um, and you are encouraged to include them as appropriate in your submissions. However, any of those organizations would not count toward the selection preference criteria. So here are some guidelines if you're considering submitting a joint application. The first thing you, that we'll look for you to do is to make sure that you identify a lead applicant who would serve as the point of contact for the application and presumptive grant recipient if selected for award. You should also just make sure to identify all the joint applicants in case you have multiples beyond just one other person. And each joint applicant needs to sign on to the application independently with a signature from an authorized representative of that organization. You can include a consolidated sign-in sheet that all the application parties sign on to, or a letter that's the same letter being signed by each of the joint applicants independently. The statement should affirm that you're joining as a joint applicant and not be just a more generic letter of support, although it can largely look like a typical letter of support, but we want to see that you're joined, that both organizations agree to join the application. And the other thing we look for is that you do identify um, some of the roles and responsibilities that you anticipate between the applicants. Now this role, these roles are at the, your discretion, but should make sense in the context of your proposed project. And effort is requesting that just so we have an understanding of how the project would likely be implemented. And so you demonstrate that you as the applicants have thought about project implementation issues in advance. It doesn't need to be an extensive document or analysis. It can be a short summary included in your joint application letter or included somewhere else in the project narrative. The next piece of eligibility is meeting the non-federal match requirements. Match requirements of the program are for a minimum of 20% non-federal match that would be provided to the project. FRA allows cash and in-kind contributions um, as non-federal match. We do have a preference for cash contributions to make up the first 20% of match. And if Amtrak's an applicant, um, Amtrak may use its ticket or other revenues from its business operations as non-federal match funds. Uh, Amtrak should indicate what sources are, are being used in that, in that case. There are two selection preferences related to matching funds. One is for achieving a 50% or greater non-federal match, and the other is for non-federal shares that consist of funding from multiple sources, which would show broad participation among all of the affected stakeholders involved in the project. And consistent with those match preferences, in the last round of partnership program selections, uh, which we announced in May, 10 of the 12 uh, selections matched at 50% or greater. Now I'll talk about project eligibility. There's a multiple step process to ask yourself to ensure that you have an eligible project. First, you need a capital project, which could include final design in conjunction with a project that performs all or part of a project construction. However, will not be funding preliminary engineering or National Environmental Policy Act um, activities or other uh, planning activities under the Fed-State Partnership Program. Secondly, you need the assets involved in the project to meet the Qualified Railroad Asset Definition. I'm going to cover that in more detail over the next three slides. And then you do need a project that carries out the right types of activities. That's repairing, rehabilitating, or replacing assets in kind, or with upgrades to the capacity or quality of service or uh, products that allow service to be maintained while you bring assets into a state of repair, or just generally that bring assets into a state of repair. Now we anticipate that most partnership program projects will, would carry out several of these activities. That's fine and expected even. Um, you can certainly, you can build new or expanded capacity as part of a replacement project. Just note that it does need, it does need to be connected to um, existing services. Now I'll talk about the Qualified Railroad Asset Definition. So projects in the partnership program need to be on or improve Qualified Railroad Assets. This is a big part of being an eligible project. And this is where that more stringent and somewhat more limited universe of projects uh, comes into play. So the definition has three parts. First, the assets need to be owned or controlled by the leader joint applicant submitting the project. 
this is where you see we limit the universe of projects to that list of eligible applicants. So Amtrak and other publicly owned or controlled railroad assets like state owned or municipality owned or um, owned by another railroad provider. Um, that's kind of the universe of the, the assets in the project here. Next, they need to be um, contained in the appropriate planning documents and planning prerequisite documents and cost allocation policy arrangements. And this is where there's the difference between whether you have a Northeast Corridor project and a non-Northeast Corridor project. And I'm going to discuss that in the next couple slides. Then finally, you need assets that are not in a state of repair. We're generally looking to really repair and replace um, some of the more, you know, uh, decrepit assets that are out there in the railroad infrastructure. And you, for this, you can reference the state of good repair definition given above and just show how that asset, uh, how your project's assets do not meet that definition. So I'll talk first about the Qualified Railroad Asset Definition as applied to a non-Northeast Corridor project, so generally across most of the country, um, excluding the, the geography I mentioned above for the corridor. So first, with ownership control, you can own the assets outright or control via agreements with the owners, either now or at project completion, that ensure that the project benefits and outcomes would be achieved. So generally, this means you have ownership, or if, you're, if you need to show control over the assets, it means long-term arrangements and ability to demonstrate that you can ensure that pro promised project benefits will be sustainable over time. For the planning documents, um, in the national system, we'll first look to the relevant state rail plan or plans where the project is located. We'd be looking at applicants to demonstrate that the project is included in that state rail plan such as in a future project list or identified capital needs section. Many plans include these sorts of project lists that include their planned intercity passenger rail improvements. If it's not in your state rail plan, then you have options. You can show either that the, there's one or more equivalent planning documents that do contain the project, or you could amend your state rail plan. Now, the type of equivalent documents might include local, regional, or corridor-related planning documents that include the project. And you should just be able to demonstrate that the project you're proposing has been considered involved in that planning process and document. If you instead choose to amend your SRP, the state rail plan, we do productions for the process in the NOFO in Section D, and you can do that concurrent with submitting your application. On the cost allocation policy, Again, in the national system, you should show that you're part of the Passenger Rail Investment and Improvement Act, that's PREA, Section 209, Cost Methodology Policy, which includes all of Amtrak state-supported services. Or if you have a project that is not located on a PREA 209 corridor, you should demonstrate to us that the project assets are subject to some sort of similar cost allocation agreement, which would mean that you might make a contribution toward the cost of providing the interstate services or operating and maintaining the facility or assets. Finally, you need, as I mentioned above, assets that um, are not in a state of repair. So we do ask you to describe your current asset condition and performance um, and indicate how those assets fall short of the state of repair definition. Now I'll run through the same criteria when it comes to the Northeast Corridor. So for ownership and control, it's the same um, criteria. There's no difference. It, we look for the same thing. We're looking for uh, assets that are owned by um, the lead or joint applicant or they are, are controlled by the lead or joint applicant through agreements with the owner. It's a different planning document and here the you should demonstrate that the project is included in uh, the Northeast Corridor Commission's five-year capital investment plan if the project is not currently in that capital investment plan, then you can again either show that the project is contained in the equivalent planning document or update the capital investment plan through such procedures as the NEC Commission would establish. Um, some certain types of projects, such as equipment assets like uh, equipment replacement projects, are not included in that capital investment plan. And so applicants proposing those types of projects may use other planning documents to satisfy that equivalent planning requirement. 
The other place that the requirements differ is here on the cost allocation policy. And in the Northeast Corridor, the assets have to be subject to the PREA Section 212 cost allocation policy, which by definition covers the same geographic uh, territory um, and all the rail owners and operators that are under the definition of the Northeast Corridor I gave above. So that geography aligns. And then nothing different on the stage of good repair. You also should describe the asset condition and performance and indicate how the assets do not meet the state of good repair definition. Now I'll talk briefly, that covers eligibility. So now I'll talk briefly about the evaluation selection criteria for partnership projects. The evaluation criteria includes technical merit factors and project benefit factors. These are fully spec'd out and, and specified in the NOFO in section E. The technical merit factors focus on project readiness and applicant capabilities, such as demonstrating that you have the appropriate legal, financial, and technical ca capacity to carry out the proposed project, that you've developed the appropriate SOW and other project documents, um, that the project is completed or will soon complete necessary pre-construction activities, and also looks at items like applicant past performance. The project benefit factors include demonstrating what benefits and outcomes the project would have on the transportation system. So this includes elements like safety, integration of transportation modes, improved service quality or performance, um, and the ability to meet ridership or passenger demands. There are also numerous selection criteria FRA will take into account as it makes selections. We have the preferences there around uh, Amtrak not being the sole applicant, having joint applications, and the non-federal match requirement. We also will take into account these key department priorities that you see listed here. Finally, I'll close out this section with a reminder about a few other just restrictions and requirements to keep in mind. Uh, I did mention earlier, preliminary engineering, National Environment Policy Act related clearances are not eligible activities in the, in the partnership program, so those would not be included um, and funded under this NOFO. We also follow the same guidelines as we do for all of our other FRA programs, um, where costs incurred prior to selection are generally not allowable, um, and that's consistent with the, the Code of Federal Regulations that governs federal grant making. And we also are prohibited from funding sole benefit commuter rail passenger transportation projects. But we do recognize that many partnership program projects will be located in shared corridors where commuter and intercity passenger rail, as well as freight rail, may all operate. Indeed, we have selected applications uh, for shared benefit projects that have been submitted by commuter rail authorities in the first couple of rounds of the partnership program. So if you have this type of shared benefit project, our guidance is the project must represent a reasonable investment in inner city passenger rail, even if there are benefits to other modes. We do want you to include all of your project benefits in your submission, but be sure to call out the inner city passenger rail benefits specifically and justify your project as a reasonable investment in inner city passenger rail. If you're in a shared corridor and don't specify the inner city passenger rail benefits, your application could be at risk of being determined ineligible even if it's clearly on a shared corridor facility. And then lastly, for Northeast Corridor projects, um, we do require that you be compliant and remain compliant with the NEC cost allocation policy throughout project duration if you were selected for an award. With that overview, I'll now hand it over to my colleague, Ruthie Americas. Thank you, Brian. This is going to be a quick overview and it will be familiar to some of you who have participated in our previous webinars, but specifically this will be for folks who are new to grants. First, be sure to take a look at the NOFO or Notice of Funding Opportunity that Brian mentioned. It's the public announcement of the grant opportunity and provides information about the grant requirements as well as those important details on how to apply. If you go to our webpage, you will see a link and it is also listed on the Federal Register. So what is a NOFO? Here is a list of information, the different sections in the NOFO. Today we are specifically going to go over the items that are bolded, the eligibility information, the application and submission information, and the application review information. 
So again, for those of you who are new, it's really where do I start? So to find information about FRA's grant program, specifically the grant program we are now accepting applications for, look on FRA's webpage on our discretionary grants program. On that page, you can see the summary information about the Federal State Partnership for State of Good Repair grant program. This is the only grant program we are currently accepting applications for, but that can change at any point in time. You'll see a link to the NOFO that announces the grant opportunity in the Federal Register. Once you go to the Federal Register, you will see that this announcement was published on June 10th. Note the application due date of July 27th. Applications are due by 5 p.m. sharp on the 27th. If we receive any applications after that time, they will not be reviewed at all. So it is very important that you submit your application early. Please do not wait until the last minute because these applications are time stamped. Also, please note the CFDA number 20.326 you can use that number at any time to find out more information about this NOFO during the application process. Now we'll move on to another polling question. Thank you, Ruthie. Let me bring this over. So our next polling question is, do you have experience using grants.gov? A, yes extensive. B, yes limited. C, no experience. All right. So it looks like about 15% have uh, extensive, 41% has limited, and 43% have no experience. Back over to you, Ruthie. Great. That's good to, good to see that. Need some experience, need some that phone, need some more. So the next section is primarily for those who have limited or no experience using grants.gov. So after you read the NOFO and decide that you meet the eligibility requirements that Brian went over, you will need to access grants.gov to read the directions on applying electronically and finding other informa important information about the grant opportunity. On grants.gov, you can search for the Partnership Grant Program using the CFDA number, again, I mentioned it, 20.326, to go directly to the opportunity. The synopsis on grants.gov provides a summary of information about the opportunity. And if you look at the top right in red, you'll see the Apply button. This is where you will start your application. So do know that before you start your application in grants.gov, you will have to be sure to obtain a Dunn and Bradstreet number, Dunn's, and register in the Federal Government's System for Award Management, SAM. This is extremely important. And I strongly recommend that if you are not registered or do not have a Dunn number, you do this as soon as possible. The entities registering in SAM must, be, must submit a notarized letter appointing their authorized entity administrator. The SAM registration may take two or more weeks. And you must have a DUNS and be registered in SAM prior to applying for your grant. It's best to obtain a DUNS and then register in SAM, and then when you can start working on other parts of your project application, your project narrative, and other application parts outside of grants.gov. So once you're registered, you'll be able to just submit your documents. As you prepare your application, be sure to focus on the required documents listed in the NOFO, particularly the project narrative and statement of work. Two of the documents that our technical evaluators are looking at. Other important documents listed in the NOFO include the benefit cost analysis, which our economists review that is required for this grant program, and information and documentation on your environmental compliance. Here you'll also see other forms required in your application. You'll complete these forms electronically on grants.gov. So again, give yourself enough time to complete these documents. So it's best if you don't have SAM, if you're not registered in SAM and don't have the DUNS number, do that immediately, and then you'll have time once you're able to, to do all these forms on grants.gov. And here you'll see you get additional information on the grants.gov. On grants.gov, it's on the bottom of the synopsis page. Okay, Brian went over a little bit about the process, but we'll get, we get a lot of questions about how long it's going to take, or if we have a 
announce the selection yet. So this is just a little bit about the process. Once you receive the applications, they are, they are first reviewed for completeness and eligibility, those that were submitted on time. All the applications that are complete and eligible then move on to the evaluation stage, and those are evaluated by a panel of DOT subject matter experts, and they use the criteria outlined in the NOFO, which Brian spoke to. It's really important to pay attention to the evaluation criteria and selection criteria. That information is all related to our selecting officials. We have a senior review team as well as our FRA administrator who makes their selections, and then those are reviewed and, point and approved by the Secretary of Transportation. All of this takes some time before we make our announcement in the press release that can range from four to five months since we typically get a large number of eligible applications with the partnership grant program. So it takes a while for us to go through that whole process. So keep an eye out on the FRA webpage to see if that announcement's been made in a four to five months from now. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Brian to talk about best practices to follow. So I'm going to go through some best practices in preparing your applications that could help to make you most competitive for selection. The best overall advice I can give you is to just make sure you read the NOFO carefully. And after you've done that, you can read it again and then even one more time. Uh, we have tried our best to give you all the information you need to successfully apply and be selected <clears throat> within the NOFO. Now, the best practices I'm going to go through will focus on three areas where we often see weaknesses or shortcomings in applications. And I'm going to start that with just discussing the project narrative, best practices when preparing your project narrative. Now, project narrative is a core element of your application. It's usually one of the primary documents that FRA will review to understand your proposal and for you to make your best argument for why you, would be, why you should be selected. You really should spend effort to make the narratives clear as comprehensive as possible. You also should keep in mind, and I'll show you now the um, outline of the narrative here on the, on the left. Um, you should keep in mind that FRA's reviewers will include a range of subject matter experts who specialize in di different geographic regions or different parts and functions within the rail industry and we may or may not have much familiarity with your exact particular project. So your writing the narrative should try to limit jargon or at least explain any project specific terms or geographic specific terms to ensure that you communicate your project clearly to the FRA reviewers. So as I said, this is the project narrative outline as we lay it out in the NOFO on the left. And we do encourage you to simply just follow this outline as you go through. Um, it, it can structure the narrative in a nice logical way. It helps us to know that we have that everything that you submitted a complete narrative and it has all the elements we are looking for. Um, and in the NOFO, there, there are sections for each of these and that gives some information about you know, what you should include in each of the sections. And you should be able to just sort of follow through that as you prepare um, your response. Um, one thing I will note, there's a few places where you only need to respond if you're a Northeast Corridor project, or and vice versa, you only need to respond if you're a national non-NEC non project. Um, and you can, you know, you obviously only have to respond to one or the other if you're pro depending on your project location. I will say we have had applications where the project location would occur in both geographies. And in those cases, our best practice is to go ahead and respond to um, the criteria and instructions for both geographies. So not much to say about the cover page other than just include what we do list and ask for on the title page. Uh, but for Fed State, the key thing is you should include, if you're submitting a joint or solo application here on your title page, and identify who the joint applicants are. Um, it's also helpful to just develop a nice logical project title. That project title will end up being, being used in many contexts during review, and so it's helpful to have a nice concise and functional title. The project summary is your short four to six sentence, you know, one paragraph write up of what this project is, where it's happening, why you're doing it. Um, it can describe, you know, the high level, what's the scope, what are the anticipated benefits, what, why are you putting forward this project. You can really think of that as your elevator pitch. Again, this is something that often can get used in a number of uh, instances during the review and selection process um, as a nice shorthand for like, this is the purpose of this project. 
when for project funding, um, the key element here is to make your funding request clear. You know, make sure you make really clear is how much funding are you requesting? In other words, what would that award about amount be that you want from the partnership program? You also should identify all the funding sources you're anticipating, including all the non-federal sources. You can reference in the write-up um, any letters of support or funding commitments that you have from various from funding partners if that's applicable as well. And you should note any um, restrictions or limitations on the use of match funds. Perhaps they have to be expended by a certain date or on certain project elements. And if you're in including in-kind match, so a non-cash match, um, you should indicate what types and what the nature of that in-kind match is and describe the amounts, how you valued and arrived at the, at the, at the value for the in-kind match. Uh, you'll notice I jumped past applicant and project eligibility since we discussed those back at the start of the presentation. And so now on the detailed project description, this is where you expand on that project summary. This is often the, lar the longest single section in your narrative. And this is where we're looking for you to give us the full picture of the project. You know, expand on what it is, where it's happening, and why you're doing it. You know, what is the project doing? Describe the scope. What challenges or issues are you trying to address with the project? What do you anticipate as the outcomes and benefits? And why is this project needed to deliver those benefits? Um, it's also where you can identify uh, important elements of context. Maybe there's important to understand the owning or host railroads in the project location or other rail operators that operate at the facility or along the line. You could provide some background and history if there's a story to tell about how you've come about to have this project proposed for, for the program. This also is a great place to include photographs or diagrams um, with captions that explain what you're actually showing in those photographs or diagrams. Um, that can really help illustrate and demonstrate, you know, especially in this program, you know, where the assets are in degraded condition, for example. Um, and you can include quantifiable information here too. You know, is this a busy rail line and, or facility? How busy? How much usage does it get? What types of usage? Uh, with in the inner city context, you know, what's the daily or annual ridership? Um, if it's a shared corridor, you can include commuter related ridership too to understand how many, uh, how many passengers are there, number of train moves along the corridor. Um, that type of information, you can really pull in some of your most compelling stats of data to support your project um, into the description. For project location, um, we do want you to just identify, you know, city, county, states, where the project's located. Um, one of the forms you'll fill out when you submit also identify districts where the project's located. We do appreciate you to including a map of the project. Usually it helps to have kind of an overview, um, larger area map that shows maybe the broader context, the metro region, or at the state level, depending on your, the geographic scope of your project, as well as a close in um, map of the immediate project area. Um, if your project involves grade crossings, uh, please do include as well a table that gives the USDOT National Highway Rail grade crossing inventory number for those crossings so that we can align that with our, uh, our, our database and information on those crossings. And then uh, just to reiterate, if your project is a single facility or site, maybe it's a station or yard or terminal area where it's relatively, can, it's relatively um, small actual location, um, do consider including a site, site plan or facility map and showing some project location specifics. Like at a station, you might indicate what tracks or platforms or sections of the station would be worked on um, in the project. If you have extensive and more detailed drawings, like engineering drawings or track schematics, those can also be attached as appendices to your submission. Um, oftentimes, they don't translate well into the immediate you know, narrative. When it comes to responding on evaluation selection criteria, we do ask you just follow the instructions closely here. Note that there's a number of criteria, and you'll want to be responsive to all of the criteria um, you know, certainly a project might be more focused on particular evaluation or selection criteria than other criteria, but you still want to try to address and respond to as many of those criteria as you can. Um, you also can bring up here your reason for, um, 
you know, why this project is valuable and worthwhile. And that often can come from your technical analysis. So if you can quantify the benefits of the project here. Maybe you did that in your benefit cost analysis and you have your benefit cost analysis report or repeat and elevate the key findings of your BCA um, here into the project narrative. And then the last two, um, on project implementation and management, there's uh, two, uh, there's basically two elements here. Um, the first is to discuss your past performance, so past experience that you might have as an applicant uh, managing and overseeing similar projects, especially if you've already done grants or are currently doing grants with FRA or with our other mobile administrations in the department like FTA, or Federal Highways. Um, and you just want you to summarize that experience that you've had. Uh, it, yeah, your organization's had. And then the second part is to talk a bit about your expected arrangements for carrying out this project. You know, how does your organization, if you received an award, plan to approach the project? Are you expecting to contract it out? What's your method for project management over that contracting? Do you know who your key officials would be who would lead the project on your agency side if you were selected? We recognize you won't know every last answer of project implementation and management at the point of application. But if you give some sense of what you would intend to do, that can help us understand, you know, if we selected this project, here's how we would anticipate it being carried out. And then for environmental readiness, um, the key thing is to tell us where you are in the process. Um, so if NEPA is complete, you know, indicate the date and completion of NEPA. That's, again, the National Environmental Policy Act uh, documents. That might mean you have a categorical exclusion, a finding of no significant impact, or a record of decision. You can provide a link or a reference to that right in your application document in, in the project narrative. Um, if it's unaware and not started, update this on status um, and what you would anticipate the review to be, whether that would be um, a categorical exclusion, environmental assessment, or an EIS, uh, environmental impact statement process. Now, a number of Fed State projects to date have been at the categorical Get categorical exclusion level. And I do want to call out, and you see the note at the bottom of the screen there, we just recently did a webinar um, about our NEPA and categorical exclusion process. That was held back on June 10th, and that sl those slides and recordings are available on FRA's mm -hmm. website. So if you have a project that you're preparing that is a likely CE, I encourage you to seek out that webinar, um, give some great advice and, and current information about our CE process at FRA. Okay, um, now we'll transition over to some best practices in preparing things like statements of work and project budgets. So we do have templates for, the, the, for preparing these documents. Um, I think we have this down in the links, so if you see it in the web links pod, uh, we have a statement of work web page that has a template, um, and the templates there include a statement of work template, schedule a temp template, and a project budget template, we encourage you to use those templates um, in preparing your materials uh, in your application. Now, when you're preparing the SOW, um, you do, the key thing here is organize your scope of work into discrete, logically sequenced tasks. The, probably the biggest thing with the standard work is just be logical and organize about the tasks and how those tasks connect to the project budget that you have. You should also think about what deliverables you might have that could communicate status or completion of project work that would be appropriate for FRA to receive. This basically should be a draft of what you anticipate you would do with the funds that you're asking for. Um, you only need to describe in the SOW those, those elements that the grant is going to be involved in buying. So, you know, if you perhaps are, are proposing phase one of the three-phase project, you can focus your SOW on what phase one would accomplish, the, the cost for that. Um, I think a good way to think about it is after reading the SOW, even a relatively novice person should have a pretty solid understanding of what the project is, what the task will be, how much it will cost, and how long it will take. Now, I will say that for projects that get selected, um, SOWs are almost always updated following selection. You'd work with FRA's staff. Um, professional staff to move the project toward a war, and that usually involves revisions to the SOW. But we, we appreciate the clarity in, that you can bring in the SOW to submit with your application. 
And then when developing project budgets and cost estimates, um, we have another resource for you, which are our standard cost categories. And it presents a way for you to organize the scope of work and budget. And there's a link there on the slide. Um, and that using the standard cost categories help ensure consistency across the narrative, statement of work, BCA, and other, other materials. We also have a capital cost estimating guide that you can refer to and, and review um, if you're looking for assistance and guidance in how to develop a capital cost estimate. Okay, now we're going to shift to discussing preparation of the benefit cost analyses. But before I get going on that, I'm going to hand it over to Mary, and we have one more poll question for you. Thank you, Brian. Um, the question is, do you have experience preparing a benefit cost analysis for FRA's discretionary grant programs? A, yes, extensive. B, yes, limited. C, no experience. And we'll give that a few seconds more. Okay, thank you all so much who participated in the poll. Uh, about 47% are limited, 47% are no experience, and 4% um, are extensive. And Brian, back over to you. Okay, thank you, Mary. Uh, yeah, we've got a couple folks with us that uh, have ex ex extensive experience, but um, uh, interesting to see that kind of even split between some experience and, and no experience. So um, let's talk BCAs. So I'll just start with like purpose, right? Like why do we do benefit cost analyses? What, what are some reasons we might? And there's basically three in the context of this program. Excuse me. Um, the first is that benefit cost analysis can help uh, it can help encourage applicants to focus and refine their projects. So it can help you focus your project definition and scope to ensure there's a clearly defined project that has clear outcomes that can be analyzed. Developing the BCA often helps kind of trim or rationalize projects into discrete and clear elements. BCAs also are helpful as a method for cross comparison between diverse types of projects. And here in the Fed State Partnership Program, we do face that challenge with stations, infrastructure, and equipment assets of all different types and that often have very different uh, cost and benefit structures. And doing a BCA is a way to help try to level the field between them and get to an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. And then it's also um, simply just required as part of preparing your application. We are directed to take um, benefit cost analysis into account in the evaluation and selection process for Fed State partnership program. It's quite similar to requirements in a number of other US DOT programs uh, like Chrissy with FRA, Tiger Build, or the Fastlane Infra programs in the department. Um, but I will note that the Fed State uh, program does not require that all selections have any particular benefit cost ratio or level of benefits. And in this program, we definitely consider BCA as one factor among many that we look at uh, during selection and evaluation. So here's a basic overview of the process um, as you think about preparing a benefit cost analysis. But essentially, the first thing you want to do is just work to specify the base case, alternate case, and timeline. And I'll go over that next, but that basically is, you know, what's the world today? What's it after the project? How long is it going to take? You'll then want to show how that post-project world will result in particular changes and effects. That, that essentially are your project benefits. You're going to do technical work to break those benefit costs down into the smallest sub-elements sub possible to help facilitate the actual calculations that you're going to do. You should assign values, um, the monetary values, using our benefit cost analysis guidance. Um, that is a a uh, link as well down in the, in the web links and also a link available in the NOFO itself. And then at the end of the whole process, you calculate your results and you discount back to your base year. So in talking about kind of the scope of analysis,
analysis, the base case is your current situation. Now, for a state of repair project, I encourage you to make sure that your base case is ac accurately reflecting the operating condition. You might be doing something that's a repl an in-kind replacement project, but it's somewhere where today's trains might experience significant delays or re reliability concerns um, on that degraded infrastructure, and at project completion, those delays would be reduced or eliminated. You'd want to make sure you establish that degraded condition in your base case so that you have a base and then a new alternate condition to compare against. And that's that alternate case um, where, you know, that's the alternate case here usually is the proposed project and the results of the proposed project. Note that you could have an application that has kind of multiple projects in a BCA context. Maybe you have a bridge replacement um, that has certain benefits and some track work elsewhere that have certain benefits. You may want to analyze those separately and distinctly in the BCA context, and then you can combine your results overall, um, but you can still apply for that within one application. Um, and then you do want a timeline that is appropriate for the proposed project. The goal here is to match the useful life of your project. It's basically the construction period plus up to 30 years. Now, if you have assets that have a useful life that extends out beyond 30 years, our guidance directs you to take a residual value of that remaining useful life instead of trying to go um, and, and forecast operations at 50 or more years out. Uh, we, we feel the, the Outcomes are too uncertain on those time frames, so we instead direct you to use the residual value, which you will see in the, in the benefit cost analysis guidance. And what you're looking to examine are the differences between your base and alternate case. Um, in general, other future projects are irrelevant. We're really trying to focus on the, the specific of the project that you're applying for and seeking funding. Um, and those other projects would like that go beyond that amount wouldn't really be brought into your BCA. But we do recognize there are some cases where you might have a benefit cost analysis that covers a broader scope than what you're planning to apply for that's already completed or something, uh, you know, analysis you already did. In those cases, we ask that to the maximum extent possible, you itemize out and bring out the benefits specific to the proposed project that we would be funding. Um, also, when you're thinking of the differences, they need to reflect realistic projections. So just a couple examples. Um, you know, interstate passengers who are making longer trips are probably more likely to change modes if a station was unavailable compared to com commuters who might have options to go to another station that's only a couple of miles away. Um, host railroads might have speed and weight restrictions that they'd, that they'd apply to a route before they'd actually shut down service entirely. So if you think about the types of assumptions you might make, um, another one being, you know, growth rates aren't likely to just suddenly up and double passenger travel growth rates or something like that unless a fundamental change occurs. So a few points of guidance about calculating project benefits and costs. Again, the marginal effects of the alternate case are those benefits. Um, Occasionally, those might be under, undesirable. It could be the case that future costs are higher or um, another or emissions might be higher in the future or something of that nature. Those will be reflected as negative dollar amounts in your analysis. Total costs, of course, are all the costs associated with implementing the project. And when it comes to O&M on the cost side, you actually should look at your net operating maintenance costs and include the result as benefits. Um, so for new infrastructure equipment, that's often a negative dollar amount um, because you didn't, you maybe didn't have the infrastructure there before. You went from one track to two tracks. You might have higher O&M in the future, but in the partnership program, oftentimes uh, future O&M might be lower. Uh, if you're replacing a, a, you know, a, a, a asset in poor condition that requires a lot of upkeep and maintenance today, and the future one won't require nearly as much, that should reflect the net savings, and you can include that as a benefit. Residual value, similarly, that I just talked about, also credited as a benefit, not subtracted from the costs. Um, additional considerations. Again, you want to break down your impacts into the smallest possible sub-elements. 
Um, this is where you want to put a lot of your thought work in. So, you know, maybe you have travel time savings. You want to look at the components of that, um, where the delay reductions are, the faster speeds, or other causes, and combine those into the results. You kind of work from the ground up and sum up as you go. Um, you should provide documentation for your, your key assumptions and inputs. And, you know, remember also that your project might have a bunch of different types of benefits. So maybe you're replacing a bridge. Well, the results of that could mean, you know, improved through speed. Well, there's a travel time savings. It might mean there's reduced delays or weights on approach to the bridge where it was, it was a choke point before. That could be travel time savings and emission savings. Um, it might reduce delays on down the line that are additional travel time savings and emission savings. Um, and the new bridge may be not nearly as expensive to operate as the old bridge that got replaced. Uh, mobile diversion is what occurs when new users or riders are attracted to the rail service thanks to a project that improves the services. So if they change from another mode, it's diverted from that previous mode to rail. You can also have new trips uh, that are not diverted from another mode, but induced to happen as new service is more attractive. Now, in general, new users uh, are valued at less than the value of existing users. So your existing rail passengers would get the full benefits, but new users who get attracted to rail receive less of that because they weren't already on the system. They had to use some of the benefits you put in place to attract them to come to the network. We have a guidance, in, in our guidance, we have a rule about using the rule of the half of 50% of the value for new, uh, new users relative to existing users. Um, make sure on revenue, revenue is generally a transfer, not a benefit. Uh, it's generally a transfer from one entity or another, not something that's a benefit to the public. Um, that's also consistent with the DOT guidance. And just as an example, you know, if there are rail, this is a kind of a freight related one, but uh, if there were you know, if you're avoiding diversions from rail to truck, you could be avoiding some highway damage and additional emissions and safety concerns. Finally, with BCAs, um, make sure you document your assumptions as much as you can. That's a really central thing that our evaluators look at is, did you make reasonable assumptions that went into your BCA? Um, if you have those multiple distinct elements and projects, identify those separately in a BCA context. Um, you know, if you're using mobile diversion, if it has elements of mobile diversion, please include your passenger and freight traffic counts. Um, if you involve grade crossings, give us updated information on the annual average daily traffic at those grade crossings. And include, we ask this in the instructions, include an unlocked Excel spreadsheet that shows your calculations and discounting. Again, that's extremely helpful and valuable to our reviewers. Um, and just helps us make sure we're doing the best quality analysis and review of your application. Okay, I have a few um, recap and reminders. I know that's been a lot of information in a short time. So just a few more slides here, and then we'll get to your questions. So first, remember to read that NOFO carefully. Um, you should think about what a successful project might look like. Uh, we've now had two rounds of selections in the Fed State Partnership Program, so you also can look to those previous selections to understand the types of projects that have been successful. Uh, make sure you submit all the necessary documents that are asked for in the NOFO, and just in general, be straightforward, clear, and direct throughout your application. It really helps in our review um, if you're just clear and direct about your project scope, current conditions, and explain the expected benefits in a straightforward way. Another key quality, or uh, another key element to do at the end is some quality control. Um, so this is a, one key element. We always get at least one submission where funding totals submitted across the application don't match. So please double check your funding amounts um, everywhere you might have listed them. That might be in the project narrative, SOW, the SF424 form, or other forms. Um, make sure they're also internally consistent when you do those budget numbers. Um, you should, you know, we encourage you to send letters of support, especially from other key partners in the project, uh, like such as host railroads or your joint applicants. And our last tip is to have some other objective outside cold, cold reader, um, someone who's not directly involved in developing the application, read it before you submit it, just to catch any, any other errors or points of confusion that might exist. 
And we do also often receive questions regarding the timing of grants award once we make selections. So here's a timeline showing those typical timeframes. So once you have a selected project, you enter the pre-obligation phase. It usually takes six to 15 months. And in that phase, you're working with FRA's regional and grant managers and our other subject matter experts to help develop the, and finalize the statement of work, schedule, budget, any performance measures involved in the project, terms and conditions of the grant, and, and finalizing and completing NEPA requirements. Then post-obligation, you enter in the part where you're actually carrying out the project. Um, you'll have ongoing meetings with our staff. There'll be monitoring reviews, but that's where we're actually delivering the work. And once the project is completed, we have a closeout phase. It's usually much shorter. Um, where we just do the final invoicing and, and performance reports. I also want to call your attention to one last um, uh, resource that we have. Uh, FRA has a competitive grants application process web page. Um, and that's also in the web links down below. Um, it has this handy flow chart that uh, you see along, you see small here along the right hand side. It illustrates the whole process um, from NOFO no announcement through grant obligation and gives you a, a, a way to sort of follow that through. So I do, rec I do recommend that to you as a resource. Um, that link's in the pod. You can also reach it just going to FRA's homepage, uh, clicking on grants and loans in the title bar, and then you apply for grants options in the sidebar. And I will just note um, we, we went to the last slide there that has uh, both Ruthie and my contact information as well as a colleague who is not with us today, but Nate Vavasil, um, on benefit cost related questions. So if we weren't able to answer your question here, um, do feel free to reach out to us uh, with that question via email and um, we're happy to provide technical assistance. Thank you all for joining us today for the Fiscal Year 2020 Federal-State Partnership for State of Good Repair Grant Program webinar.